It's time for the Blazer Power Hour. Welcome to the Blazer Power Hour. Introducing the Blazer Power Hour. No, see it. It's time for Blazer Power Hour. Hey, friends. It's time for the Blazer Power Hour. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Blazer Power Hour. You're checking out the Blazer Power Hour. Welcome to the Blazer Power Hour. It's Blazer Power Hour. Go ahead. Are you ready? Are you set? Got everything all ready to go? Let's do it. Let's do the Blazer Power Hour! It's time for the Blazer Power Hour. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, the weekly show where we try to take and bite off a specific topic for an hour and see what we can do with it. Um, I decided to dive into some Blazor hybrid apps this week, and uh, I want to share some of the setup uh, tips that I'm, I'm starting to stumble across. These are things that I've just run into in the last couple hours or days, and um, getting the setup was not terrible but it wasn't straightforward either so uh, hopefully there are some things that I can share with you about blazer hybrid apps today that'll help you get started um, if you do a quick Google search for this term this is the landing page that you'll end up on uh, build your first hybrid app and I can share this in chat with you all uh, this is not the only thing you're gonna need though so I'm finding there are more steps to getting this set up than uh, what might be listed in here um, <clears throat> it does rely on uh, the templates that are provided with the Xamarin uh, blazer mobile bindings so there's a link up here about how to get started with that one thing I found a little bit confusing about it is this is a dotnet um, six thing so this is dotnet six but when you go to this page and uh, you start getting acquainted with blazer mobile bindings it says to get started you'll need dotnet core 3.1 sdk and that is not the case unless you're doing specifically the blazer mobile bindings and not blazer hybrid um, but you do need some of the uh the tooling that is part of this Blazor mobile bindings. So you're gonna need to install some things here. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that you need is uh, this new .NET template, which I have installed on my system. And you need to, need to do this under the context of .NET 6 as well. I suggest using a uh, global.json file, which we talked about on the show before. Uh, <laughs> Sam's here. Uh, asking about tree shaking. That's a JavaScript thing. We don't do tree shaking, Sam. We do IL trimming. That's much more, much more uh, precise in the .NET world, right? 
I'm kidding. It's all semantics. It's the same idea. Um, mobile development on Blazor Power. Yay! We're getting there. I hope it works. So I was trying this earlier. It did not work. And I appreciate Sam jumping in chat. And Sam, you're welcome to join me live as well if you uh, are feeling uh, inspired to jump in. Um, I'm more than happy to have you come on the show. Um, so if you're doing .NET and you're dabbling with the latest bits, uh, and I will bump up the font here so you can see what I'm up to in the command line. Uh, I do highly suggest that you start incorporating a global.json file. It just will help you uh, and solve a lot of headaches. So a global.json file is really simple to create. You just drop one in the root of... Um... <laughs> hey, I Sam, look, dude. This is this is live streaming. I we're not in the same room. I don't have to smell you, my friend. That that technology thankfully has not been invented yet. Um, I highly suggest a global.json file. So um, if we want to look at what that looks like, we can open that in Visual Studio Code and take a quick peek. And it is very simple. You just create an object with an SDK of the version that you are supporting in any project that is in this path. So it is path dependent. If you have another global.json up the path, it will overwrite it. And uh, if you do not have one, it will fall back to the parent. So in this um, project folder, I have all .NET 5 projects at the moment. So this repos directory here, um, is all .NET 5, and I also have a repos directory uh, for .NET 6. You can um, organize these however you would like. Uh, this is what is working for me right now. Um, <laughs> so uh, Sam is going to bow out, but uh, that is an open invite, my friend. Um, in this, you will notice I don't have a global.json and this is going to take the latest version of .NET and I've been tinkering with this hybrid app uh, structure in here. So to get this uh, .NET template installed, you'll run this command line. It won't hurt if I do it again. So I'll just go ahead and drop that into my command line again. Um, also, if you're not familiar, this is con EMU that I'm using. I really enjoy con EMU. Um, uh, oh, that's a great tip. Smab UK says .NET new global JSON instead of creating it from scratch. I did not know that. That is an awesome tip. Um, thank you for that, Smab UK. So if I run this, it will reinstall the template, no problem. And again, I'm using Con EMU. I don't like the Windows default um, console. It just not great. Not a great experience. Con EMU is where it's at, my friends. Give that a try sometime. Uh, so it says that the experimental, that I love how they just plop that right there. Make sure that you know up front that this is, it says it everywhere, by the way. This is the experimental uh, mobile Blazor bindings hybrid app, and it was successfully created. And if we want to list out our templates here, we can say .NET new and it will just spit them out on the screen. And I think the this one is up top because of the E in the experimental. And uh, like I said, this bundled together with the mobile Blazor binding stuff, uh, which we're not actually gonna use uh, directly here, but we want the Blazor hybrid app. That's the template that we wanted to use and we're looking for. So we'll get that one set up here in just a moment. Um, it says it will create a folder named first blazer hybrid app uh, with a solution with five projects and there's going to be uh, these five projects so we should get this and run it and see what exactly uh, we get out of it the new list sorts by tag oh okay let's see here so let's give this a run um, let's create a directory for it first. Uh, 
we'll just drop this in the power hour here and uh, we will run the new template and the template again is uh, used use the short name to execute it uh, so we'll say uh, let's see here are there any flags let's double check and make sure there's flags um, we can just put an output directory on there if we want to uh, sure why not let's just throw that on there as well so I think it'll actually create another directory but we'll be inside of one just to make sure uh, so it was created successfully uh, let's see here we've got my first blazer hybrid app and if we look there's five projects just like it said and we should probably op open this up in Visual Studio preview so we want to open this up in Visual Studio preview Um, I have, uh, here, let's go to the Visual Studio installer real quick because I want to show some things here that we'll be needing in a moment. Um, this says up to date. You want to make sure that you have Visual Studio 2019 preview and everything in it is up to date. Notice they install side by side. So we can have both Visual Studio 2019 and preview running on the same machine. They do not have issues with each other. Um, I have not run into any problems with them conflicting with each other. Uh, this has been a very successful side-by-side -side installation. Um, if you're not using a global.json file, that is where you might run into some issues. But uh, otherwise, the Visual Studio part of it seems to run just fine. I'm not going to launch it from here. I could. Um, I want to keep this screen open because we are going to need to look at it in just a minute. Um, and then I open the wrong Visual Studio. So there's that. I can tell the difference right away because not only the preview, but I don't install my themes on um, the preview edition. But I want to come back here and I'm going to go just use a little shortcut here. Explorer uh, dot. And that's going to bring me to the folder that my files were written to. And you can see the Blazor hybrid app project here. And if I click on my solution in Windows, you get this handy little drop down box up here. Not sure if you all know this is here, but if you click on a solution file, uh, you will actually get all of the editors that are available for that project. So that's pretty cool. It's a nice little tip. So you can come in and select the solution here. And what you can do is say open and I'm going to use Visual Studio Preview for this project. Um, and I don't know why it's asking me again. Uh, what you don't want to do is select always open this solution file because that will default preview to every project that you ever use for it. Sublime is missing. If I installed Sublime, Sam, I wonder if it would show up. Uh, so Windows Defender is hitting a firewall. will allow access. This is something for Xamarin, I believe. Um, I've had a lot of uh, first encounters with dialog boxes after I've installed this. Um, you'll notice up here that we have, and I think it's still loading, give it a moment. This is a pretty fast machine as well, so this, uh, this shows how experimental can behave on one's machine. All right, so we've got the five projects up here which two of them we will be completely unable to use because I don't have a Mac device. You need a Mac device attached to your network or uh, Sam, you had some other solutions if you don't mind sharing those in chat uh, for building iOS and um, Mac OS applications with Windows. Uh, these are not things you can do natively. You need third party uh, services or actual Mac hardware that is on the, uh, the network with you. And then it will offload the build process to those hardwired devices. So I do not have those. Therefore, we will remove them from the application. I'm going to work on possibly getting some hardware for that so we can try those out sometime. Uh, but until I do that, I'm just going to yank them out of my project. And Visual Studio is a little slow on this stuff. Uh, you can cloud build iOS, uh, but you're paying Apple in some way. Yeah. Apple doesn't miss out on getting their fingers into your wallet at any moment. That's why they're in court right now. 
and uh, good luck to the folks at Epic for standing up to the schoolyard bully. Um, we've got three solutions now. We've got Android and Windows, um, and we could also have a web app in here as well. Maybe we'll add one unless this can run it on its own. I haven't quite looked at this yet to find this all out. Um, but I do want to make note of something with the Android section here. Uh, so I came up across this yesterday where this Android project here said that uh, it needed migration. Literally said needs migration right there next to the Android um, section of this application. And if I can, here, let me try to pull this up off screen. I have a screenshot of it, but it is in a work channel. And I don't want to necessarily share uh, work conversations. So let me try to pull this off screen for a moment. Try to keep our uh, work chats separate from the show here. And there we go. That'll work. That'll work. I've got it for you guys. Uh, so this hybrid.android is my project. It says needs migration. Um, you, you can click and you can search on that thing all day long and you're not gonna figure out exactly what that means because the help is really terrible on it. So what that actually means is you need to come back to your Visual Studio installer if you're not a uh, cross-platform developer and you need to go to more here, or sorry, no, modify. You need to go to modify and you need to install the proper workloads on the machine. And that means you need the mobile development workload. Uh, this one right here, you might as well add this one while you're at it. Um, and it never hurts to have your desktop environments on there as well, because Lord knows what else it needs from these SDKs to do the desktop dev. So I just suggest checking these three boxes. It's gonna add uh, some additional bits to uh, your, um, your your primary drive or wherever you decide to put that, but uh, it is worth it because it will get rid of uh, those warning messages for you. And like Sam says, yeah, you can't expect to build the apps without the SDK. Um, I just assumed they that things got installed and they did not. It's just a few gigs. Sam, you're the guy that always complained about hard drive space. Look at you now. Look at you now. You must have got a big SSD for Christmas. This guy, he used to complain all the time about his hard drive being full. Now he's like, eh, just a few gigs. Not a big deal. Uh, so that will resolve errors with uh, your Android app. It will let you run uh, the Windows desktop apps as well. So make sure you have all the SDKs checked off on that list. Um, that's going to get you over quite a few hurdles. The last one I just ran into, um, I don't even know if I've got this set up correctly yet, but we'll give it a shot. Um, we need to pick Android or Windows here to run the project. And I'm going to go ahead and try the Android one. I'm going to use set a startup project. Cross your fingers. Hope this works. It hasn't yet. Um, we're going to run the Pixel, the Google Pixel emulator, and it is booting up fine now, it looks like, because my host hypervisor has changed, and that is actually a good thing. Um, it is building in the background. There it goes. The phone is starting. Uh, this was not working earlier, and it came up with a message that said that... Uh, the emulator requires um, acceleration to work properly, and there are some pop-up boxes that come up. Um, the one that is generated off of the build process is not a very good error message. Uh, there is another error message that comes up when you come to Tools and go to Android Device Manager. There's an error message that comes up in here that gives you better instructions on what that error actually means. And what it means is you have to go out and enable hypervisor on your machine. So if you don't have hypervisor enabled, uh, you have to go to add features. Uh, so you can come down into your search bar and just start typing add features. Um, 
And of course, it's going to erase it the minute I walk away from it. So if you've never enabled hypervisor, we've got to turn Windows features on and off. And then you want to come into the Hyper-V section and check the Hyper-V platform checkbox. And then there is also a second option in here uh, for Windows hypervisor platform that you also have to check. You gotta check those two boxes, hit OK. It will install, um, yeah, it will install some things and quote, make it faster. So this enables hardware acceleration for uh, the Android device. Um, so this is actually creating a virtual device. Um, uh, this Hyper-V is a uh, virtual PC or virtual uh, device platform, and uh, it will run hardware acceleration through Hyper-V. Yeah, Sam's right. Yeah, it will give you time to go cook a big breakfast. It will give you time to eat a big breakfast, and then interacting with that that device will also give you headaches. So you have to install Hyper-V for this thing to work properly, or it's going to just sit there and load forever into eternity. And now we actually have a Blazor app in Android that's working. I'm so excited. This actually worked. Um, so the, that was a lot of steps. That was a lot of things. That was like 20 minutes of conversation we just had just to get this running. So hopefully that saves you all time uh, in getting this working. Uh, because uh, even though I've had experience with these things way in the past, it's been a while since I've set up emulators uh, on my my primary development uh, setup, um, it was a refresher to walk back through those things and have to do them again. So uh, make sure you have all the SDKs installed. Make sure you have Visual Studio Preview installed. Make sure you have Hypervisor enabled. And one last catch, one last catch. If you're gonna stream and you install Hypervisor five minutes before the stream starts, it will kill your internet for no good reason. So down here in the corner, in the corner where it says, I have an internet connection. Um, for some reason, Hypervisor blew this up. Uh, I could not get on the internet, which is why the stream started five minutes late. Uh, so the way to fix that is just to simply right click on it and hit troubleshoot problems and Windows will figure it out on its own. I don't even know what was wrong. Windows just said, here it's fixed, go back online and do your internets. So here we are. And uh, Smab's got the answer here. It's the network bridge and it changes your network devices. Yeah, so uh, that's a good point. If I go into network, let's see, can I see it on this tab, Smab? Uh, it's just gonna show off all my Roku devices. Um, network. It will show virtual network devices in one of these screens. Change network adapter options. There we go. It should be in here, right? Right, Smab? Uh, so we've got Ethernet and then V Ethernet. I'm sure that's the Hyper V Ethernet adapter. So that's what uh, Smab was talking about there. It adds a new virtual network device. So the, this is, uh, for all intents and purposes, I may be dumbing this down uh, just for the fact that uh, we need to explain it in a short period of time. But this is to enable my... Uh, emulated Android device access to the interwebs. So that, that bridges my, um, my device here with the actual internet. So I can go out in, in HTTP with my device. Um, you'll, you'll run into issues with this. Like if you're, there's no concept of uh, local host. Um, when you're doing, say you want to open like your, your Blazor app that's running on the web with your Android uh, Chrome instance, uh, you might have to might have to jump through some hoops to get that to work. So anyway, that's what that did. That's a good explanation of it, uh, Smab. Thank you for bringing that up. All right, so we we have a Blazor app running in an Android emulator, but what's nice is we're not running it in. Uh, Chrome. It's not running in Chrome. It's not running. You can access localhost. It just takes, yeah, it takes some steps. It does take some steps. 
it's not something that's intuitive either, or it wasn't. Um, you have to open ports, if I remember correctly. You have to mess with the ports. Uh, so this is a hybrid application uh, for more than one reason here. It, it The name comes from not only the fact that it is inside of, this is a Xamarin Forms application running on Android. So this is a native Android application. But this section of the app right here is a native Android app UI. So this is, uh, we'll go look at the code for this in a minute, uh, but this is, I think, a stack panel and a label. I think, is it a, is a label a component? Something like that. It's text. Uh, and then a native button. And we can increment the count on some global state in the application. Uh, the other part, the hybrid part, is the Blazor app that is just kind of wedged right in here. And this is in a... Um, a Blazor web view, which is a special web view that is running inside of the native application, um, but it has access to the Android hardware that uh, Android, or sorry, a Chrome application would not have. Uh, so we can increment the count here on Hello World, and then we can also navigate over to the counter and notice that we're in sync here with the count. So that's pretty cool. So if we go ahead and close this emulation down and go back to our application, we can take a look. I, Sam, you played with this a little bit. Does hot reloading work with the emulator? Should I have closed that? Do, is that necessary? Or can you come in here and just play with stuff live and watch it refresh and do magic? Um, so this is a main activity. This looks to me like the entry point to the application. Um, I want the, the main view here, Sam, uh, where is that view at is because there, there has to be a XAML file in here somewhere, right? We have main theme. Where's the XAML application that has the web view, or part of the application that has the web view in it? That's what I'm trying to find here. Does it just exist in, this is all the Blazor stuff. Um, we have resources. This is all of our static resources, I believe. It's in the shared part. So it is in the shared part. We have a web UI. Where's the razor or the um, it's under pages. This is the part that's inside of the app, main.razor, main.razor. Ah, there we go. Ah, there we are. Oh, I didn't know they actually called them razor when they were being used in a, a hybrid app. So that that's new to me. Um, so this is actually mixing uh, this is actually really surprising here. I guess this is the uh, the the uh, mobile bindings that are doing this for us. That makes sense now. So this is the native part of the app uh, where we have our uh, stack layout. So this is essentially in the uh, CSS ver or the web forms, Xamarin forms, Xamarin forms version of the uh, Flexbox. So we have a stack layout. Uh, this is where that hello world label exists. I was right. It was label. Uh, I'm, I'm refreshing myself on some XAML I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, we have a, a native button and that has the increment binding on it. And when we click that button, it increments the count and it updates the global state in the project. Um, and then here's that Blazor web view. And this sets up the Blazor portion of the application. And we can call in the web UI.app, which is the entry point for this Blazor um, shared library. <laughs> 
Uh, this is this is not going to happen, Sam. Zamel, this is my this this is uh, sorry other people's exit ramp for Zamel. So this is how you get out of the Zamel world. So right here, uh, what we need to do is just take this out. We'll, we'll take this and we'll comment that away, and then just leave this beautiful little piece right here. This is all we need anymore. This is it. This is the end game, Sam. This is the end game right here. Is getting getting from here to here in the shortest period of time. So then we can get to this. This is this is the holy grail right here. HTML, my friend. <laughs> uh, they're all they're both great, I'm sure. Um, we will be able to uh, use this stuff to build some really interesting applications. <laughs> yeah, so uh, oh, I wish I had uh, watched Avengers recently. I, I need to rewatch that one. It's been a while. I, I need to get refreshed for the Black Widow. I, I need to see that too. I have not seen uh, any Avengers movies in the last two years. Um, so let's see. Uh, let's see if we do take that out. Let's let's go ahead and take that out for a moment. Jokes aside, we'll take that out. Rerun the application. Uh, let's see. Does it need to reload? It's reloading in the background, and it should reopen for us. And then this is just a full Blazor application at this point. It's still hybrid in the sense that uh, Blazor has access to. Um, some of the underlying uh, APIs that it doesn't normally have. Um, and uh, Curious Drive has a good uh, question here. I wonder how a Razor class library reference would work with this solution. That is an excellent question. I am not sure. I need to dive into this a little bit more. Uh, try adding some things like Telerik UI for Blazor here and see what happens. It is not supported quite yet. Uh, by us, so we're still investigating this ourselves. Uh, it should work just as it does. Famous last words, Sam. Same as famous last words. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't try to add Telerik UI for Blazor. Yeah, um, we might do that on the uh, live on the show sometime. WebView has its limitations. So this is a fully operational Blazor app now that is just pretty much Blazor. I don't have any of the native uh, buttons and, and whatnot in it. Um, there, there are really good reasons to have native UI. Uh, there are also really good reasons to write once, deploy anywhere. <laughs> People want me to uh, cross the uh, the boundaries of uh, testing beta things inside of more beta things and put edit and continue is currently unavailable due to an internal error. Yeah, that's expected. That sounds about right. So our web UI has all of our um, Blazor app in it. And uh, the app.razor is the entry point uh, of the application just as it would be um, this is our, our main entry point component for the application just like it is in a web app uh, this main dot razor is new though the main dot razor is a blazer hybrid thing um, and then the counter state is uh, very much a uh, just a dot net thing so this is how we share the state throughout the application this is the same way we control state in a Blazor app or a .NET app. So nothing really uh, crazy changes here. Um, the one little notable thing here is this state has changed. Uh, since the web, or sorry, since the Xamarin application is changing the state from outside of uh, the Blazor component lifecycle, we need to hook into it on the Blazor view and update the page when uh, that event takes place. So that's why you see a state has changed here and we invoke it when the count gets incremented. That keeps the Blazor 
uh, UI in sync with the state. Uh, look at main activity in Android. That's how the app gets bootstrapped. Main activity. So here's where we are, we're booting up the Blazor hybrid application, Sam says. Um, the onCreate method is override. This is called when the activity is starting. This must be a very Android-y thing, the activity, main activity. Um, and then on permission request result. Uh, this is going to request permissions for uh, device access. Is that what it's doing? Uh, so we can access uh, like static files on the device, Sam. This is Xamarin Forms for now. It will be Maui in the future, Sam says. And what is the nuanced difference between those two things? Uh, this is where things might be different. Um, uh, Curious Drive, when you said, I wonder how adding Razor Class Library might be different in this solution. Um, we do have this file provider in uh, the uh, Xamarin or soon to be Maui application. Um, and it's adding static assets from that WW root folder. Uh, so this is using the native um, file loading mechanism, the asset file provider on Android to load those static assets. So Xamarin Essentials gives you native API access. Um, uh, this is another thing here. We can control the uh, the I or the device toolbars and resources there as well. Um, I'm sure this could also give us access to uh, things like the camera and all that. And uh, and Sam's pointing out they are different from Windows to Android and to iOS as well. Um, so let's take a look at the Windows application. So if we go back to the Windows application here and let's set that to our startup, I'm also gonna go over to my main.razor and on comment this so we can see it in the Windows uh, application as well. And if we run the hybrid app again, this time we're gonna get the desktop deployment of it. And this is where responsive design is really going to pay off big for your Blazor apps. So uh, we have a desktop app now, but it's still running the same uh, web UI code that we saw on the Xamarin shell that we just used. So learn your media queries, folks, because if you're gonna do hybrid apps and they're gonna run on desktop and mobile, you're gonna want these things to scale well. Uh, the shell that, or not shell, but the base template that we're given uses, I think, Bootstrap still. Uh, Bootstrap is decent for this. Uh, we do get like some little flyout menu things, uh, which is nice, but um, there, there's a whole lot more that we can do. Uh, so again, we can increment the counter with a native uh, UI button, and uh, we can click that counter in its shared state again. Uh, just like the Blazor applic or the uh, Xamarin application, we have too many technologies going on in this one solution. It gets to be a mouthful really quick. <laughs> um, so Marcus says, uh, for non-native app, what advantage does this give me over a PWA other than having to publish the vendor, getting to publish in the vendor app store? Having or getting? Like that's a privilege, or is it a um, is it a bug or a feature to you there, Marcus? I can't quite tell what the tone was with <laughs> having to publish in the vendor app store. To some people, they see that as uh, a way to earn profits from their app. So that's uh, uh, a privilege, not so much a necessity. Um, Sam says not a whole lot at this time, but native UI uh, and API access. Um, we're also missing out on one very important feature, and that is the .NET framework is not running 
in WebAssembly in these scenarios. It is the full .NET framework on hardware, which runs much, much faster to the tune of several hundred times faster than it does on the web, unfortunately. Uh, in in uh, .NET 6, this might get to be less of a performance gap than it is right now. But uh, for the current time, uh, we do not have WebAssembly in here running this application. It's running natively um, in .NET on the platform of choice. So in this case, the .NET framework is running on a machine that has 64 gigs of RAM, and it's an uh, Intel i9 processor. It is not running in WebAssembly in the browser. So that, that is a big difference there. So that is another reason, Marcus, uh, voice programmer, that uh, we might want to use uh, a native approach is um, for speed. Uh, speed could be a, a big reason. Uh, the native um, API access can be a big one as well. So in, in desktop applications, uh, PWAs give you some of this stuff, but not all of it. But uh, you can do things with um, the, the tray and uh, notification services. And um, PWAs will give you some of this functionality here where we get uh, the toolbar access. And um, I don't think you get like the smart uh, menus and things like that, but you do uh, with PWA, but you do with a native application. So you can control what users see when they right click down here. Um, you could put native toolbars in. There, there's a lot of different things that you can do uh, in a native scenario. Um, I think you can use uh, schedule tasks and things like that as well. Uh, there's also uh, security and authentication uh, things that you can do um, with the native application running in Windows. That, that's a big deal for enterprises. So uh, when, when Sam said that uh, a native API access for uh, Windows would be available at some point, so what I could do here, is, well, for one, if it's on a Windows device, um, just IT can control that a lot better. But I can also use native Windows APIs to do, uh, what is it called uh, these days? Uh, Active Directory authentication, ADFS. Uh, you could do that locally, uh, right with the application, and bounce it off the Windows uh, APIs. So there's that too. And that's a, that's a big deal for enterprise, I think. Enterprise would be very happy to have those controls over the application. Uh, so if you're, um, let's say you change careers, we'll put a positive spin on it, you change careers, then you're no longer able to access an application. Those, those access uh, privileges can be revoked very easily and controlled very easily through Active Directory. And then you would no longer be able to load this application on your, on your devices. And Frankly, you'd probably be locked out of them anyway. So um, there's that. That's a big deal for enterprise, uh, revoking access and controlling access, access controls. Big, big deal. Um, so that, that's going to be super popular with the enterprise crowd, in my opinion. Um, that was always the first point of contention with web apps when I first started building them was how do we control access to these things? Uh, generally, they got stuck behind a firewall, and then you needed to log in through a VPN uh, to get to the application, and then the application had to have a login. So it was like these, you know, two jumps through uh, authentication to get in, and that was annoying for users. And then people without VPN access would need to get in the app for some reason or another that we'd have to put it outside the firewall and then that would change all the security profiles. This, this kind of alleviates some of those things. It can. It can also complicate them more, but it can, it can also alleviate them. So that is another reason. So we have native, uh, we have uh, Blazor web 
and they're in the same view. What's nice about this model is I think the migration strategy behind it is going to be pretty easy. Um, this allows a nice bridge between the two platforms to go towards Blazor if that's where you feel like you need to be. There's a lot of um, promising things that you can do with Blazor. It's very easy from a .NET developer perspective to get um, on board with it. If you never have done HTML or CSS before, you may be up against some hurdles. Uh, we're working at um, uh, making this easier with our Telerik UI components here at, at uh, Progress. So we're going to try to help you as much as we can with that transition. But I think that's the biggest um, roadblock with this technology is uh, just bridging that gap between uh, native UI and web UI because they are still very different beasts the way they are written, even though they have a lot of similarities. Uh, one thing we should probably play around with is, uh, and you're very welcome, Marcus, um, we should try to build like some views and put them in parity with each other, like do the same view in, um, in uh, the native components and then do the same view with Blazor and see just how same similar or different those two approaches are. That would be a fun little project to do sometime on the show. So we'll just uh, kind of summarize real quick here. We'll take one last look at these two projects that we've got. We've got the Windows application, which that, that one was pretty easy to get up and running for me. Uh, that one took very little um, installation, just had to make sure I had the right SDKs installed and uh, made sure Visual Studio Preview was all up to date. There was quite a few updates that had come out since the last time I had opened it. Uh, the Blazor Hybrid Android app, because of the emulators, and this has gotten so much easier, I'm not complaining by any means. Uh, this has gotten so much easier over the years, but uh, several steps, just several steps. Uh, and then Sam's just being difficult here. He's saying that I can I can style XAML with CSS now. We're inviting web folks, but see, we're still using XAML and XAML's icky. It has cooties and it doesn't belong in my clubhouse. No. no, I think that's really cool that we can style with CSS now. It's it's uh it's somewhat limited though, right? So um, it doesn't. You can't CSS like all the things, just some of the things. Like I can't throw like media queries in and do like layouts and and all those webby things. The web the web's getting a lot easier. Like people have given it a lot of flack for like centering things, and that's all gotten a lot a lot easier. Um, as this matures out, I'm gonna try to port some apps over. One of the things I'd really like to see here is uh, Blazeport. If you've seen me do that before, that would be a really fun app to ha <clears throat> have running on the desktop and mobile. Um, Friday, if you haven't seen it, come by my show on Friday and we'll we'll check that out. We'll do some more um, media queries and stuff and learn how to do some responsive and adaptive rendering um, on that show. Uh, but uh, back to the Android app, make sure you have hypervisor uh, installed on your um, your features for Windows. Uh, that's a, a big uh, must-have. Um, make sure that you have the SDK for mobile application and, and Xamarin development installed uh, before you do this. Or you're going to have a bad day. Uh, Global.json file, highly recommended. Make sure you have all those things ready to go. And then you should be able to run the... Um, the first few steps of this uh, create a project uh, CLI command routine here, and you can have your application up and running. And if you have a Mac at home, if you have a Mac, you can uh, keep those iOS and uh, OS 10 um, folders in there and run those as well. And those run essentially the same code. Um, we can't run them, but we can add them back to the project and take a quick look and see what's inside of those projects. Uh, let's see, where's the um, the hidden stuff? Let's take a jump back in here and see if we can add those back. Actually, I know what I need to do. Let's see. And we'll just look from here. 
Uh, these have a main CS and uh, an app delegate. Uh, this is all xamarin -y things I'm not quite used to. Uh, so Blazor Hybrid iOS.init. So there's a main entry point here. Uh, UI application org delegate. Is there anything in here, Sam, that's um, worth taking a, a look at? Where is this the... Um, where are the static resources in, um, injected in a iOS application? Is there something in one of these these files that hooks that in? It's an app delegate. Uh, we've got Xamarin Forms init, uh, main page, load application. Where does load application take us? Uh, that is built in. Uh, let's see, finished launching. Yeah, I don't see. Um, That, that's it, the init does? Okay. I need to get used to uh, some of these new terminologies as we go. Sam, we might have to do a little, um, the app is the FX runtime. Okay. You're, you're the Apple guru here. We have, to, we have to get you on the show sometime. Welcome to the show, Baby Alexander. We're getting ready to wrap up here, but we've been talking about Blazor hybrid applications. Um, and some of these things I'm a complete newbie at, so uh, I've been trying to test them out on stream and see what we have. Oh, we have a WW root folder built right into this one, so it's not necessarily sharing the one that's in the hybrid app part. Yeah, this is going to take some getting used to for me. I have to explore all the little bits and pieces of this. Uh, and then we have the Mac OS. Mac OS has a main CS. And we have a view controller. And a view control designer dot CS. So I'm, I'm thinking there is a oh, Xamarin Studio. Xamarin Studio, I haven't heard that in a while. So there's a UI designer for this uh, for the Mac OS that I've not seen. So we'll have to check that out sometime. Um, I'll have to get that Mac. Uh, I'll have to see what kind of Mac I, I need for this and uh, see if I can get a hold of one to do some content on Mac and Android or Mac and iOS. Uh, so we're not stuck with just uh, Windows and Android, uh, but we can do all the things all the things right here all right so hopefully that showed you how to get started uh it didn't have any like super like uh mind-blowing demos today but it at least gives you an idea of where you can start installing things and getting this running it shouldn't take more than 30 minutes uh at best if you just uh followed the few steps that i i told you about uh you should be able to get this running and then you can tinker away at uh breaking the new bits see what they do and uh, come up with some ideas on how you might use them. Um, I know I'm going to try to get some apps running in this context uh, pretty soon. Thanks for stopping by, Sam. Huge help, my friend. Have to, we'll have to do a show sometime soon. Um, I have to try putting the, the Telerik UI bits in here at some point as well. Um, I'm going to cross my fingers, but I don't have high expectations at this point for it to work. Um, just because this is uh, the first preview that it has been... Um, released of this and uh i know there's got to be kinks that are going to be worked out along the way but we'll try it soon see what happens um but that's all the time i've got for today thank you for stopping by checking out what we're doing and um tomorrow we have a show uh we'll be doing some uh vr development in uh facebook horizon uh, Alyssa and I will be there um, later this afternoon. TJ Vantel will be on with some React development. Sam's got his chat show tomorrow. And um, we uh, Friday we have uh, UI Fridays with Alyssa. Sometimes I join her on that as well. And uh, I have my show at noon on my channel uh, where we'll do some responsive and adaptive rendering with Blazor. Uh, so this has been another Blazor Power Hour on the Code It Live channel. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon.